What does the Bible teach about gender, marriage, and sexuality? Does the Bible actually say that both homosexual desire and behavior are sinful to God? These are just some of the questions that we're going to be covering in this five-part series on God's design for gender, marriage, and human sexuality. Now, just a disclaimer, you guys, before we get going, this presentation will be covering the topic of sexuality, as I just mentioned. So if you have little ones in the room, this is not suitable for them. For those who have been with me for a while, welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new, welcome. My name is Taylor, and I am so excited, you guys, for today's lesson. So without further ado, let's dive right in. All right, so today's lesson is going to be separated into five separate sections. Section one, we're going to be talking about God being sovereign and the Bible being inspired. Section two, we're going to answer the question, what is God's design for gender, marriage, and sexuality? Section three, we're going to be answering the question, why is homosexual desire and behavior sinful to God? Section four, I'm going to share a little bit of my own personal story of struggle and healing, nothing short of a miracle there. And then in section five, we're going to talk about how the love of God can set you free. All right, section one, sovereignty and inspiration. Before moving forward, we need to lay some groundwork. Understanding God's incomprehensible sovereignty and the fact that the Bible is inspired is vital to our understanding of God's design for gender, marriage, and sex. It is the foundation on which we will further explore and learn God's truth regarding these topics. Colossians chapter 1, 16 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In our sinful natures, we are rebellious to God. Even though he is the creator of the universe, we rebel against him by being our own gods and creating our own rules. Before the world existed, God always was. He was not created. We are the creations. He is the creator. It was his idea for birds to fly, for the moon to glow at night, for the sun to keep us warm in the day. It was his idea for there to be sea and land, oceans full of glorious creatures. Everything was his idea. From the roar of the lion, to the sound of ocean waves, to the smell of a flower, to that wonderful feeling of cool summer wind on your skin, to even, yes, you guessed it, gender, marriage, and sexuality. It was God's idea for there to be humanity, made up of two genders, male and female. It was his idea for there to be marriage. It was his idea for there to be sexual unification between a husband and his wife. And it was his idea for sex to be pleasurable and to create a very powerful bond between a husband and his wife. God being in total authority over all creation, creator of the universe, loves us. This is his character, you guys. He loves us so much that he longs for us to know his truths. In a world that is fallen and full of sin and confusion and distortion regarding gender, marriage, and sexuality, he has given us his holy word, of which is authoritative to guide us into the living God's design for gender, marriage, and sex. The Bible being inspired is just a byproduct of God's sovereignty, his good character. He desires for us as sons and daughters to know him deeply, to know his truth, so that we can live in freedom and not in the bondage of sin and Satan. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Peter 1, 21 says, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And Psalm 19, 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. It's basic math, you guys. God's sovereignty, plus the fact that all of the Bible is inspired. It's the inspired word of God equals this. What the Bible teaches about God's design for gender, marriage, and sexuality is the very truth of God. Plus, what the Bible tells us about sexual immorality is truthfully sinful. So what can we say? In conclusion, God is master of the whole entire universe. He created this planet and everything in it. We did not. We are creations. He is the creator. God created marriage. God created sex. God created the two genders. There are only two genders. The Bible is the inspired word of God. With that, let's move on to section two, where we're going to talk about God's design for gender, marriage, and sexuality. All right, section two, God's design for gender, marriage, and human sexuality. Gender begins in Genesis. Genesis 2, 7 through 9 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We continue in Genesis 2, 15 through 25. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. All right, this leads us to a very important question, very important question that's going to lay the foundation for not only understanding God's design for both male and female marriage and sex, but also it'll help us understand further on why homosexuality is a relational perversion. Are men and women equal? Equal. Well, the answer is yes and no. As we can clearly see, both men and women are equal in value, worth, and both man and woman bear the image of God. However, we are very different in our designs. We are both created by God for God with unique purposes that correlate to our embodied gender beings. The design of both the male and female genders, and how they relate to one another is a wonderful and beautiful design. This design can be explained with a very, very good word. It's a word that I love and you should love too. What is that word you ask? Patriarchy. Yes, patriarchy is good. Yes, you heard that right. It is good because God is good and he implemented it within the human race. Patriarchy, which literally means father rule, is a byproduct of God's creative work and structured nature in the world. It makes perfect sense that the God of order would create order. Praise God for the patriarchy. And just a side note, 
You can't smash something made by God, for the things of God cannot be undone. God reigns, and so his truth will always be. Simply put, there will either be those who follow it and are loyal, and those who rebel and are not. The only thing getting smashed, biblically speaking, is the head of the serpent, Genesis 3.15 for reference. As we can see in this slide, Satan is the god of lies and chaos. God is of structure, order, and design. So 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not a god of disorder, but of peace. Okay, God is the creator. Out of his very nature, he is ordered. He's not chaotic. He's not disordered. He's of peace. John 8.44 says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. As you guys can see, God, cre God always existed. He creates Adam, and then out from Adam, he creates Eve, and then together they become one flesh and they create Eve children. With this in mind, seeing that God has created gender, marriage, and sexuality, it leads us to ask the following question. Why did God create marriage? Well, God created marriage for many reasons. Some of these reasons, or some of those reasons, include companionship, as we saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone, God created marriage so that humans could fulfill the creation mandate to have children and ultimately that together they would build a home together. However, there is another reason and it is that it is, and it is that, excuse me, marriage brings God glory and points to his perfect character. Marriage, even today in the 21st century, points to God's work in the Garden of Eden as a creator and functions as a prophecy of what he was going to do in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Marriage today now points to what he did do because Jesus did in fact come to earth, die on the cross for his bride, and rise from the grave on the third day. On top of this, marriage also serves as a prophetic reminder of the marriage to come at the end of the world when Christ, the husband of all husbands, will marry his bride, the church, aka the body of believers of all time and space. Through and through, whether marriages took place before Christ came or marriages take place after, after he died on the cross and rose from the grave, marriage between a man and a woman has always pointed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 21 through 24 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. As we can see, marriage points to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The relationship between the masculine Christ and his feminine bride, the church. When we say that a man is head over his wife or has authority over his wife, it does not mean that he is an evil dictator bossing his wife around and treating her like a degraded piece of garbage. No. Rather, it means that he understands that his wife is made in the image of God as well that she is a gift to him from God himself. A masculine man of honor and maturity sees his masculine essence and the masculine roles expressed from that essence as a, all capital letters, huge responsibility. He understands that he is driving the car, that he is the family pastor, that he is the head, the protector, the provider. Christ is the head of the church, his bride, and has authority over her. In fact, he loves his wife so much, he died for her. He uses his masculine authority for good. Everything Christ the husband does is for the benefit of his bride, the church. 
His heart is for the good of the church. This is why Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God has designed the patriarchal structure as a means for men to express their masculinity, to bless their wives and children. A masculine man lives day to day knowing that he is called by God through his masculine essence to be the head of his wife and household. In this masculine authority, he looks to Christ as the husband of the bride, as his model. This is his model for mature manhood. Now that we've established the creative, created order of things, let us now take a look at how God's design for human sexuality plays into all of this. So without further ado, let us talk about sex. All right. When a husband and his wife, this is so key, you guys. This is just absolutely beautiful. One of the most, this is absolutely beautiful. Just beautiful. When a husband and his wife become one flesh, it is because they were one flesh to begin with. Stay with me, you guys. This is so key. In the creation account, God made the woman from out of the man. So when a husband and his wife become one flesh, the husband goes into his wife. By doing so, the husband goes into that which came from out of him. Becoming one flesh in the proper and full way God intended is fundamentally built on the foundation of the patriarchal design of the masculine and feminine genders. What occurs in the wedding bed between a husband and his wife is in part the gifting of one's gender in the erotic to the other. Homosexuality is in part a perversion because a man did not come out of or excuse me, a man did not come out from a man. I'm going to read that again. Homosexuality is in part a perversion because a man did not come out from a man. In homosexual intercourse, a man goes into that which is unnatural. This same defilement is true for the other positional homosexual. A man who allows another man to go into him is a distortion of God's design for proper gender expression. As you can see on this slide, lovemaking between a husband and wife is a sexual full circle. A husband can say to his wife, I go into you because you came from out of me. Praise God for his creative work. You become one flesh in marriage because you were of the same flesh to begin with. This truth, which is so beautiful and wonderful, this truth is an impossibility of replication for two homosexual men. We will explore this perversion and more in the following section. So what can we say in conclusion? God created two genders, male and female. Praise God for that truth. God's perfection means that he is ordered. Satan is the father of lies. Satan is the one of disorder. God is of order. And marriage brings God glory. Marriage, God's way. There's only one form of marriage, one man, one woman, husband and wife. It points to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it, it, it gives God pleasure because it brings him glory. So with that said, let's move on to section three, homosexual desire and behavior as sin. Section three. Why is homosexual desire and behavior sinful to God? Before we can answer that question, we first need to ask another question. What is sexual immorality? Sexual immorality is anything and all things that are classified as a lie. As you can see on this slide, on this slide God creates truth. Truth being Genesis 2, 24. Marriage. Truth being patriarchy. Truth being structure, order, wonderful, holy. I could go on. Satan, being the great liar, takes what God has made and distorts it. It's vital to make a side note here. Many, even within evangelicalism, have made bold statements that heterosexuality is the opposite of homosexuality. 
This is inaccurate. Heterosexuality comes in many forms. A man watching pornography could be heterosexual. A man sleeping with his girlfriend is heterosexual. Cohabitation, prostitution, heterosexuality comes in many different forms. God's design is the marital covenant between a man and a woman. Simply put, you guys, truth is marriage. Marriage is truth. Everything else is a distortion. Some greater distortions than others, but distortions nonetheless. Everything else is a lie. This leads us to our next question. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? In other words, what does the Bible say then about spe the specific lie of homosexuality? I will not be reading all of these passages, but I encourage you, if you're not familiar with them, to go look them up and read them yourself, and in prayer, ask the Lord to convict your heart and lead you into truth. The reality is this, you guys, that God's inspired word is very clear. There's no debate, there's no argument, there's no conversation to be had. He condemns homosexuality both in desire and behavior through and through. When God speaks about homosexuality, it is always, always described as sinful and wrong. There is no such thing as good homosexuality in the Bible. The only good sexuality God speaks of is the one he designed in Genesis. Again, I say, marriage is truth. Truth is marriage. And so if homosexuality is a lie of both sin and Satan, that leads us logically to the next question. Some might even say the question of the hour. Are people born with gay desires? Well, the answer is no. 1 Corinthians 6, 13 says, The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Psalm 139, 13-14 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Scripture tells us that the body was not made for sexual immorality. This means that your body was not designed for homosexuality, which means that God didn't create you for homosexual behavior. God has created men for the masculine express expression of husbandry in marriage to a woman, his wife. Our biological design clearly and plainly reveals this to us. The male essence was designed with the woman in mind. The female essence was designed with the man in mind. Together they become one flesh, glorify the gospel, illuminate the wonders of God's perfect character, and fulfill the creation mandate. God would not and cannot, because of his perfect character, his holiness, make someone for sin. Scripture says that we are built by God himself inside of our mother's wombs. He made you to be a holy man or woman of God. He made you for himself. While we will not be reading through the following chapter of 1 Corinthians 7, it's important to briefly make note that this chapter clearly tells us that God did indeed make you sexual. But again, he made you for his design of human sexuality. While 1 Corinthians 6 clearly tells us that sexual immorality is not to be a part of a man or woman who is in sub part of their lives, a man or woman in submission to Christ, it's to have no part in their lives. Chapter 7 of, of 1 Corinthians clearly affirms that there is to be no denial of our sexual design. God made us sexual, but he made us sexual for marriage. True sexuality is expressed in the tapestry of patriarchy, of covenant marriage between a man and a woman who both are surrendered and submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is what's true. This is what the Bible actually says in Galatians 5, 24. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When we are walking with the Lord, the Holy Spirit transforms our hearts, not our DNA. Okay, the lie the lie is this, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their DNA with its passions and desires. I mean, it sounds so stupid to say that out loud. Nowhere in the Bible does it say our sinful desires are in our DNA. 
As believers, we pray that God would transform our hearts and renew our minds. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God did not say, I will give you new DNA, new chromosomes, and I will put a new genetic code into your body. I will remove your DNA of stone and give you a new DNA of flesh. Yet again, it sounds stupid to say out loud because it's just not true. The Born This Way movement is satanic. There is no denying that. It has the vile and sinister fingerprint of the enemy all over it. Those who live in the bondage of this demonic lie will never find healing unless they repent and turn to the living God, Jesus Christ, which the Bible very clearly and plainly says is a reality for those who follow him. Healing is possible in only one in one place only, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11 says this, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Focus in on this, you guys. Some of you were. Some of you were. It's in the past tense. These individuals were washed, sanctified, and justified. Who needs washed? Certainly those who are dirty. Who needs sanctified? Certainly those who need to be set apart for the holy God. Who needs to be justified? Certainly those who are guilty before God. But praise be to our holy and perfect Lord Jesus Christ. He sets the captive free. He restores all that is lost and broken. God can take a broken sinner. This is how powerful God is. God can take a broken sinner, loving them even in their sin, and use them to bring glory to him through the work of of his restorative power. God loves to use his sons to bring glory to himself. In part, you guys, this is why Satan uses homosexuality, because God does not receive glory through sin, and Satan is pleased by that fact. As we covered in a previous slide, Ephesians 5 tells us that the marriage between a husband and his wife brings God glory. It mirrors the true gospel of Jesus Christ. This is only possible if it is a man of the masculine nature marrying a woman of the feminine nature. Only the masculine man can mirror Christ, since he too is of the masculine authoritative nature. And only the feminine can represent the church, because the church is submissive to Christ just as a wife has a submissive nature. Homosexuality is a crime scene with a newbie killer. Satan couldn't have done a worse job. It is obviously and profoundly, yet again, swamped with his fingerprints. The crime scene investigator of the Holy Spirit always reveals truth and cleans house. Let me ask you guys this. If you have two men, do you now have Christ and Christ? How can Christ submit to Christ? How can Christ be the head of Christ? This is a Trinitarian mockery. It denies, you guys, it denies the very character and nature of the Godhead and how he engages with his creation. Two homosexuals mean, what two homosexuals mean, you guys, what it means, excuse me, is that Christ died for his own sake. That is selfish and wrong. Christ died for sinners, not for his own sin. He is perfect. He has no sin. If you have two lesbians, do you have the church submitting to the church? or the church leading the church? There is no body of believers without God. A church without the Lord is an abandoned and lost child. It is a forsaken wife, a wife whose husband never came to save her. It is atheistic. It is demonic. It is a lie. I'm going to say it again. Homosexuality is so profoundly marked with the devilish thumbprint of Satan. Christ without the church, 
or the church without Christ means no gospel. It means Christ never came to restore us, heal us, forgive us. It means God really isn't good. Homosexuality means that God never came in the form of a man, 100% God, 100% man. It means the love of God is a lie. Homosexuality glorifies, but it glorifies not what is holy, good, and beautiful. Rather, it glorifies the satanic and the demonic. It's a sexual act at the altar of Satan himself, one in which the demons cry out, praise Satan for their bondage. May they never become real men. Homosexuality, you guys, it's a false gospel. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel, of which is certainly marked with falsehood. I'm talking about something much worse, something that entirely denies who Jesus is and completely denying also his work in the world. There are profoundly deep reasons why God calls homosexuality an abomination. It is far more than just a perverted and deviant sexual behavior. Homosexuality glorifies the dark shadow world of Satan and his work in the world, all while denying God's holy, good, and loving work in the world through the power of the Holy Spirit and his gospel of freedom. With this knowledge, we will further explore the relational perversions of homosexuality. Let me reread Genesis 2, 23 through 25 for you guys to further clarify this. It's so important. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now that is what the Bible says. That is truth. Now what I'm about to read for you, I've written this on my own to show you guys what is going on in the demonic realm. Then Satan said, He is not bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh, for he is a man, for he was not taken out of man. The homosexual rejects the good work of the holy God, blasphemes his character, and defiles what is holy. Curse God, curse all that is holy, for a husband becoming one flesh with his wife brings glory to the gospel of Jesus Christ, whom I loathe and hate and wish had never been resurrected. I will create my own sexual antichrist, I will blaspheme the holy God by creating my own deviant hotbed of defilement, one in which a man is truly not a man, one in which they certainly will both be naked and they will feel shame, so much shame. You guys, God's design is holy, righteous, wonderful, and good. Simply put, a man being masculine as head of home is very manly and good. A woman being feminine and submissive is very feminine and good. After all, it is the very femininity of a woman that draws the masculine to the feminine, and the very masculinity of the man that draws a wife to her husband. And so again I say, sounding just like a bro sounding like a wonderful and most certainly not broken record, I would say it a million times over you guys, masculine expression in a man and feminine expression in a woman, according to God's design, is all right, all good, and all ordered. Homosexuality, on the other hand, is distorted patriarchy. As you can clearly see on this slide, and yet again joyfully stated again, men who act like men are manly. Women who've read the scriptures and understand the assignment and live it out are wonderfully feminine. It would not be strange nor odd in the slightest for a man to say that he is, for example, sexually attracted to his wife because of her femininity and her softness. Nor would it be strange nor odd for a woman to say that her husband's manly strength has great sex appeal. 
because Satan cannot create from scratch like God out of nothing, he can only take what God has already made and put his own spin on things. A man leading his wife day in and day out and even in the bedroom going into her is manly. A woman being submissive to her husband's headship and leadership, allowing her husband to go into her is feminine. A man going into another man or a man allowing another man to go into him is an emasculatory, deviant, perverted behavior. There is nothing normal or good about it. God's design for patriarchy is good. Satan's version of patriarchy is a knockoff brand. God's design is Louis Vuitton. Satan's version is the flea market. God's version is a honeymoon cruise in Europe. Satan's version is a bubble bath in your own saliva. Yet again, I say, there is only truth and then the lie. Satan is the father of lies. Homosexuality is a relational perversion. As you can see on one side, we have healthy relation relations, and then on the other side, we have the non-healthy relations. A healthy masculine man sees men as equals that he has brotherhood with and friendship with. And it's with his woman, his wife, that he has a sexual relationship with a non-equal. For the homosexual, it's flip-flopped. Men are for sex, so he's having sex with equals, and women are friends, friendship with non-equals. Those who struggle with homosexuality as part of their healing, as they're walking with the Lord and being counseled by him, it's, they're going to have to learn through the power of God, right? God's going to walk with you through this. It's going to learn. It's going to be learning how to desexualize men and learning how to relate to them in God's proper patriarchal ordering. A vampire sees all humans for food. A homosexual sees men for sex. But through the power of Christ, that man, that individual who's struggling in that way, he can learn how to see men the way God intended him to, and God can transform his desires. So what I have to say is this, you guys, wake up. If it's not clear by now, I'll say it again. You guys, Satan uses homosexuality to make a mockery of God. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Let us take a look at some of the lies, specifically from a 30,000-foot view. I've provided just six of them for you guys. Let's go through these, okay? Six distortions of homosexuality, okay? The first distortion is that Homosexuality is a rejection of mature manhood, okay? God's design for masculinity is this. Healthy masculinity was designed by God to mature and within adult age take on the masculine responsibility of leading a woman, the other not like him. In this role, he is sufficient in his headship manhood role. A man leading another man or a man submitting to another man in the bedroom and in all aspects of the relationship is a distortion of God's design. Again, how can a leader lead a leader? How can a submissive submit to a, submiss a submissive? The second distortion is that homosexuality is a rejection of God's one flesh design. A man goes into his wife because she came out from him in the first place. They become one flesh because man and woman were one flesh to begin with. A man going into another man is a rejection of God's creative work in the world. It rejects the future marriage of Christ to his bride. Rejection or distortion number three is that it is a homosexuality is a rejection of husbandry and fatherhood. Masculinity is meant to express husbandry and fatherhood. Marriage for a man, okay, you guys, this is key. Marriage for a man is the opportunity to step into the masculine endeavor of becoming a husband and becoming a father, both extremely manly, manly roles. Homosexuality does not allow a man to be a husband or a father, and through homosexuality, he denies both. Distortion number four, biological repugnancy. This is quite obvious. The bodies of a man and a woman were, were each designed by God for marriage and marital intimacy. The body of a man was not designed for sex with another man. Distortion number five, image of God, I think not, question mark. Image of God, question mark, I think not. Okay, 
marriage creates human life. And in this, we can be creators like our creator, right? He created us, and through marriage, we can create as well, right? We're made in God's image, and then we create humans made in our image, all, all made in the image of God. Homosexual be behavior cannot create human life, and thus it cannot image God, but images Satan who cannot create Okay, and then the final distortion, you guys, is that homosexuality is extremely selfish. It is not a good gift. Masculinity is meant to reach proper development and continue maturation throughout life and to be offered to a woman over a lifetime of marriage. Homosexuals use other men to fulfill neediness and childhood traumas and wounds. When you get married and you're standing at the altar with your bride as a man, you are gifting her your masculinity. She is gifting you her femininity. It's a good gift because you're receiving the very thing that you are not. And so you come together and you can build something together. Homosexuals can't do this because you're the same. You're not giving a good gift. It's very, very selfish. In marriage, a man gives his masculinity. Homosexuals are, 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 are in part taking another man's masculinity. So it's very selfish and very, very wrong. So now that we've laid some groundwork and we know that nobody is born gay, this is obvious, and we know that God is good, let's spend a little bit of time, you guys, talking about homosexual desires. And we're going to be answering some really important questions that you might be thinking yourself, where do they come from, right? If, if homosexual desires and behavior are sinful, where do, where do they come from? Why might someone have them? And wh why do men struggle with them? Why are there some men and women out there who struggle with homosexual desires? Well, Matthew 5, 28 says, and this is Jesus speaking, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. James 1, 13 through 15 says, when, God, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Lust is an evil sexual desire of the heart. It is a desire, or excuse me, it is, it is to desire something fundamentally wrong. It's to desire something that is sexually rebellious, something evil. A man who looks at his wife and says, I desire to make love to you tonight is good. Praise God. But a man who looks at another woman he is not married to and in his heart desires her for a sex act, desires that which he has no right to. To look at another man and have homosexual desires for him is to desire sin. Scripture is very clear, you guys. To desire sin is sin. To look at another man and desire a sinful sexual act with him is to want something that is rebellious. It's to desire something that God literally hates. James 1 clearly and yet again shows us that the temptation to behave in, hom in homosexual ways does not come from God. We are the problem, you guys. We are the sinners. We are the ones who needs God. We need God's forgiveness. We're the ones who need his fatherly love. The questions the person struggling with homosexuality should be asking are the following. What is my story? What, Lord, has happened to me in my life that has caused the homosexual desires in the first place? The answer is coffee. I know what you're thinking. What does coffee have to do with homosexuality? Well, I'm glad you asked. The person struggling with homosexuality has sexualized wounds and hurts and traumas. There are deep layers that God wants to process with you. He wants to help you work through that through that you will find healing. Okay. Someone who struggles with homosexual desires has gone through what I call a developmental hell. But don't worry, there is hope in Christ. I like to explain the homosexual struggle kind of like making coffee. So in this picture, you can see you have the coffee filter. That's your biological sexuality, your, your, your physical, biological sexuality. Then 
On the interior, you have coffee grounds. Those are your wounds, your childhood wounds, your father wounds. Maybe part of your story is that you were sexually abused as a child, whatever that is, right? We have all these wounds, every single one of us. We've gone through things. Everyone has a different story. We all have hurts and wounds and insecurities, whatever those may be. So when you have the filter and you have the grounds and you pour the hot water in there, what you get in the bottom is the, the byproduct, and, and that is the hot coffee. That's the combination of the two which I would classify as the homosexual consequences. And so part of your healing journey is going to be recognizing that you weren't born with these gay desires, but but you have sexualized wounds. And by walking with the Lord, by walking um, in a relationship with him, he's going to bring healing to those wounds. He's going to go deep, deep, deep down into your soul, into your heart, and he's going to help you process them. And he's going to bring healing into your life. All right, so... In conclusion, what can we say? Both homosexual desire and behavior are sinful to God. Praise God. Praise God for that truth. Our sinful desires are in the heart. They are not in our DNA. And homosexual desires are a byproduct of the sexualization of our wounds and the depravity, the, the depraved nature that we have, right? Every single human being, the Bible tells us, falls short of the glory of God. We are born with a fallen, sinful, rebellious nature. Now, with that, let's go on to section four of five, and I'm gonna share a little bit about my own story and the radical healing that God has brought into my life. All right, section four. My personal story of struggle and healing. So, a little bit about me, you guys. I was not raised in a Christian home, but was raised in a Jewish household. I had a bar mitzvah at 13. I grew up studying Hebrew, went to synagogue, celebrated holidays such as Hanukkah and Passover. When I was in junior high school, however, after he I heard the gospel message and I decided to put my faith in Jesus and I began to follow him. In this season of life, as I was developing as a young man, I soon realized that I desired both men and women in a sexual way. In the midst of these desires, and so gratefully blessed by Christ that I was already following him, it was very early on in my walk with the Lord that I was taught about God's design, that he had created the two genders, male and female, and that he had created marriage. Hearing this truth, I made a vow to save myself for my wedding night, and so while I never lived a homosexual lifestyle as defined by the world, I struggled deeply behind closed doors in secret. I battled lust passionately and wickedly viewed heaps of pornographic filth, having anonymous chat conversations with strangers in the dark, vile shadows of the internet was another sin that I partook in. My struggle with homosexual desires became my deepest, darkest secret. And as my teenage years progressed, swimming in this pool of fiery lust, I burnt ever the more. Romans 1 27 says, Men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. As a teenager, feeling the voice of conviction that my homosexual desires should be something I deal with was met with a, well, I'll deal with this when I'm older. Well, older would come, most certainly, and it would happen just a few years after graduating from high school. I like to refer to this moment as my mirror moment. There I was in my childhood bedroom around the age of 21, 22, staring at myself in the mirror. This moment was so representative of so many questions and broken spaces within my soul. But honestly, it was a plain and simple moment of an effeminate, broken man boy, looking in the mirror and simply hating who he was, lost and confused in so many ways. At the core of the mirror moment was one representative question. One question to rule them all. What does it mean to be a man? The fact was this. If I were to look deep down within myself, there was not the fullness of a man. There was not the fullness of what a masculine man should be as made by the living God. This, my friends, was a crisis of masculinity. My homosexual desires were rooted in a massive crisis of manhood. Many pray stupid prayers like pray the gay away. This prayer is an attempt at asking God 
to take away symptoms. Symptoms are not the problem. Problems, yes, but not the origin. The root is the origin, and it is when we deal with the root that the symptoms find healing. My homosexual desires were sexualized wounds, layers and layers and layers of things that had happened to me growing up and things that had not happened to me growing up that I desperately needed. And so this brings us to the next big question. How did I find healing? First and foremost, it was in the fathering of God. Psalm 68, 5 says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. To sit in that beautiful knowledge that I was not a fatherless boy, that I didn't have to go to the filth of the internet to find masculine affirmation, but that I could rest underneath the mighty, masculine, and awesome power of my creator God who loved me beyond comprehension, healed, healed my hurting boyish heart. The wonders, the wondrous healing of sitting and speaking life you are my father and I am your son. I would repeat that to myself over and over and over again, and I still do to this day. That is where broken boys become men. Through the fathering of God, I could finally be trained up in all the ways I craved. I could walk with the Lord and finally become the man that I longed to be. I could, th I could through his counsel and fellowship, not only learn about his design for gender, but I could be restored. I could have God go back in time to all those wounds and all those broken spaces in my heart and find his healing touch. Because of the gospel, I could enter the presence of God, king of the universe, and pray wild, manly, brawny prayers. Restore me, O God. Make me into a masculine man like your son, Jesus Christ. Make me hate what you hate and love what you love. But my healing wouldn't just be in that private place of fellowship with God. No, God would not hold back from me that which would bring me deep healing. What I am about to tell you guys might honestly blow your minds. And I'm, I'm not lying about this. This is, this is literally true of my life. I didn't have my first male best friend until the age of 22. The most profound healing medication that God has administered has come from learning how to relate to my own gender. For years, behind closed doors in secret, I had sexualized men. And acro across, excuse me, can I speak? <laughs> across a wide space of various wounds, too long to list here, I did not know how to be a part of the world of the masculine. By having male friends for the first time, and I'm not talking you guys just about, hey Tom, how's the weather? I'm talking about true ride or die brothers, brothers in Christ who for the first time gave me that masculine camaraderie that my heart truly craved. I found intense and insane healing. It wasn't a sin, this is very key. It wasn't a sin for me to want to be masculine or to feel connected with the masculine. I had of course in my own depravity gone to filth, but God knowing what I really needed gave me true masculine brotherhood in the platonic. And by doing so, I not only received masculine love and connection, but became more masculine myself by the day. I truly found rest restoration in my own masculinity. God has brought radical healing into my life and he wants to do the same for you. So what can we say in conclusion? The Father has brought healing into my life by restoring my masculinity, by going deep down into those wounds and walking with me and bringing transformation. This is a huge part of the healing journey. It's sitting with the Lord and looking back, almost being like a time traveler and looking back and going, this is what God does in that council. He begins to show you, man, like the reason why I'm craving this is because as a child I didn't get this or this happened to me when I was this age and that makes sense as to why I'm looking for that. God begins to walk with you and, and you begin to he begins to piece your story together. And not only does he show you, but he transforms you. Your desires begin to change, right? Scripture tells us that when we're in Christ, we're new creations. And 
in that fathering of God, he sanctifies us, he transforms us, he changes our hearts, he renews our minds, he fathers us. As I showed you guys earlier, God is a father to the father, fatherless. And it's in that fathering and in that brotherhood that God brought radical transformation into my own life. So with that said, let's move on to section five, how God can set you free. How, how does the living God want to set you free? Well, it's through the gospel of Jesus Christ, of course. What is the gospel? You might be wondering, what does that word even mean? Maybe you're hearing that word for the first time. Gospel simply means good news. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay. We have to fundamentally humble ourselves before God. And as human beings, we have to recognize that every single one of us, we're all filthy, dirty, wicked sinners. We are full of evil desires. God is holy and perfect. We are not. Because God is so holy and because we are full of sin, what we deserve, because God is just, is to be sent to hell for all eternity, separated from the holy God. But God loves you, God loves us so much that scripture tells us he sent his son to die on the cross in our place. Right? We deserve to die. He died for us. And three days later, on the third day, he rose from the dead. And by doing so, he died for our sins as a sacrifice for our sins. And when God brought him back from the dead, right, now Christ, the living God, 100% God, 100% man, is victorious over death, sin, and Satan. And so when we put our faith in Jesus and we say, Jesus, I believe, I believe that you are the God of the universe, the creator of everything, and that you love me so much that you died for me, and I put my faith in you, be my Lord and Savior. When we put our faith in him, surrender to him with all our sin, God's going to forgive you of your sin. You'll be made right with God. You'll be adopted into his family as a son or daughter. You'll be given the um, indwelling spirit of God. And you will be given the gift of eternal life with God forever. And what God is going to begin to do in your life he's, is not only is he going to forgive you of your sin, and give you eternal life because you're now forgiven and made holy, but he's also going to begin to transform you and sanctify you. That's a fancy Bible word or a fancy theological word for make you like his son Jesus. And as we walk with the Lord in that father-son relationship, he changes us. The desires we used to have, God begins to take those from us and he gives us new holy desires Maybe you're insecure. Maybe you have father wounds. All of those traumas, those wounds, God goes into those places and he brings healing into our lives. God wants to bring healing into those places. He wants to go into your story. He wants to go into the molestation, the pornography addiction, the insecurities, the father wounds, the mother wounds, whatever it is. God wants you to humbly surrender your life to him, recognizing that he's God and you're not. He wants you to be a part of his kingdom, not this fallen, deviant, satanic world. He wants to bring restoration to your life. He wants to heal you from your sinful desires. He wants to make you like his son, Jesus Christ. Everyone has a story, you guys. Every single one of us. We all have stories. My story is not your story. Maybe you are struggling with homosexual desires and, and maybe there's some overlap in our stories, but you have your own unique story. I have my own unique story. Every single one of us has a unique story, but God will meet you there. Wherever you're at, God will meet you there. And the, and the most, one of the most awesome, one of the most beautiful questions, can I speak? I've been talking for a while here. I'm getting tongue-tied. One of the awesome questions that we get to ask ourselves when we're following Christ is, What's our story? What's your story? God wants to enter your story and he wants to radically transform your life. He wants to take you out from the world and make you a part of his world, his kingdom. So I want to end 
present this presentation, you guys, with with a prayer. So if you would uh, bow your head and close your, close your eyes, if you if you want to do that. If not, you don't have to do that. But I do want to end with a prayer. Father God, I lift up to you now whoever is watching this lesson, God. Whoever they are, you know who they are, God. Whether they've struggled with homosexuality or some other sexual sin, God, whether they've struggled with their own sense of manhood, God, whatever it is, you know their hurts, their traumas, their wounds, their brokenness, God. You know every hair on their head. Whatever it is, Lord, you know it all. You are the sovereign Lord of the universe. And I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would bring insane transformation into their lives. I pray that you would restore them back to your design for biblical masculinity. I pray that you would teach them your wonderful manly ways and set them free from the lies of Satan. I pray now in the name of Jesus Christ that you would move in their hearts and bring healing into those deep wounds that they have lived with for so long. You are a father to the fatherless. Lord, be their father and show them the love you have for them, which is incomprehensible. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your masculine son. Amen. All right, you guys, shameless plug here. I wrote a book, and I'll put a link below to it. It's on Amazon. You can buy a hard copy, or you can also buy an ebook version. It is a work of fiction. It's not my story. It's not based off my life. But the plot goes like this. The summary of the book is this. 18-year-old Christopher Stone couldn't have run away from his childhood in Ohio any faster after graduating from high school. With a one-way ticket to San Francisco, he hoped to find adventure, purpose, identity, and perhaps even love as an openly gay young man. But after a year on his own, his depression returns, leaving him feeling hollow and unfulfilled. As suicidal thoughts plague his psyche, Christopher calls out to God as a last resort not really knowing if God is real or even cares. Positive he's been given a sign, Christopher must decide if his encounter was truly God or just wishful thinking. Again, I'll put the link below if you're interested in reading reading my book. I just want to thank you guys for watching. If you stuck it through to the end, if you want to stay connected with me, there's uh, several ways in which you can do that. I have a website. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And then if you're watching this, obviously, you're probably watching this on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you can stay up to date about future videos I post, future books that I will be releasing. And also, too, um, if you have different topics or questions that you would like me to cover in future videos, that's another great way or reason to reach out. Um, leave me your questions. I love getting your guys' questions, your comments, your um, ideas for topics you want me to cover. And uh, you can do that on Instagram. You can DM me on Instagram. That'd be a great way to do it. Again, thank you guys for watching. Be strong, be mighty, be manly, and be loyal to our living God. God bless you guys.